So can I introduce Tom Hankey from uh, Queen Elizabeth Building, called in, I think, 2016, is that right? right. 2016, one of the rising stars at QEB. Uh, he does do private FDRs as an evaluator, as he was telling me last night. Uh, I hope his name is on the FRC uh, list of private FDR authorized uh, personnel. Uh, I think the very fact that he does do them, he was telling me he does the modest value cases because that's the, the level of call he's at. That, uh, to my mind, demonstrates a very important point, which is that private FDRs are not just for the rich. Uh, I've long maintained that it is a fallacy for people to say it's only rich people who can afford private FDRs. If you pay a thousand pounds or fifteen hundred pounds to a junior barrister to do a private FDR in a case where the assets are, I don't know, hundred thousand pounds even, uh, and it brings about settlement, that is a lot better than going to trials. So the market for the lower value cases for private FDRs uh, should be expanding, all of which is basically a plug for Tom as a private FDR uh, <laughs> judge. But I'm going to hand over to him now Very to much. talk about the matrimonial home uh, on which I think he's going to give a, a, a broader overview than might appear from the, the words themselves. Ah. Um, thank you very much. Um, this lecture, uh, Nicholas Mostyn has very kindly asked me to give, and it comes out of an article uh, in the marvellous FRJ, which you've already heard so much about, uh, written by um, Fiona Stewart, also of QB, and myself. Um, and that article uh, looked at the sharing principle as it applied to the family home. Uh, and the question that we wanted to look at uh, was, uh, does one always uh, share in the family home? Now, you might think uh, the answer is pretty obvious, and uh, Lewis Marks, who's sitting down there, uh, when I told him about it, uh, told me it was going to be a very short talk, because <laughs> the answer is, yes, you do share in the family home, but you don't always share equally. So um, for those of you who are just here for some top-level uh, advice, uh, that is the answer. Um, you can go now. Um, however, I thought it would be interesting to try and trace the stories. It's a bit of a historical talk, in a way, of how the law has taken on the question of uh, what we do with the matrimonial home, and I'm going to focus mostly on where the concept of sharing comes from. So again, this might be disappointing to some of you, but we're going to be looking at law which you can't necessarily rely on in court anymore. Um, what I'm going to try and argue, what I'm going to try and say is that I don't believe that sharing starts with white. I think it is an invention uh, of the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, I'm going to tell you, talk you through that um, and how I think it affects some of the presumptions uh, that we have in the law today. Uh, and then I'm going to try and offer some thoughts about where uh, sharing might go next. Um, and uh, I'm going to try and do all of that in half an hour, which might be an ask. Um, so we're talking today in the shadow, I think, or the, perhaps the anonymous shadow of uh, Baroness Deitch and Baroness Shackleton's draft bill, which some of you will know about. Uh, finally, they've uh, stimulated the Law Commission to look at the Matrimonial Causes Act. So we'll be seeing some more about that over the next couple of years. Um, and their bill, uh, for those of you who haven't read it, would always have the family home treated as matrimonial property, um, always be shared equally, save in quite limited circumstances. And so the sharing principle uh, over the matrimonial request would be enshrined in statute, um, having become, uh, as they would see it, an obvious social norm, which we would all agree with. Um, and also, as a code, the Labour Party at their conference uh, this week um, have announced that they're going to look into extending financial remedies provision to cohabitants. Uh, so we may have a, a law of financial remedies for the first time that's not simply uh, consequent on marriage, but is consequent on the relationship. And at the end of my lecture, I'm going to think about that a little bit. Um, I should say that I wrote this lecture before I uh, bothered to look at my, how long my speaking slot was. Um, and so there's a much, much bigger version of this talk, which um, I will circulate for those uh, who are interested in it. And if you are hankering to know what uh, Blackstone thought about the matrimonial home in the 1770s, uh, if you'd have done slightly better as a wife in the province of York versus the province of Canterbury um, in the ecclesiastical courts, come to me. I've got things to say. Um, <laughs> but to, to skip 4,000 words of a, of a talk, which is already too long, um, the short summary is there was no redistributive system of property prior to the Second World War uh, worth its name. Um, the pressure, um, it, it simply didn't exist. Um, the pressure for a system uh, that did provide for redistribution grew after the Second World War for several reasons. Uh, and briefly, the number of family breakdowns increased. Um, there was only one in 450 marriages that ended in divorce prior to the First World War. 1937, you have the Matrimonial Causes Act, which slightly widens the goalpost for getting a divorce through. It doesn't really affect the numbers. But after the Second World War, you suddenly have an explosion of divorces, uh, 50,000 a year. Um, and then it's a steady state through the 50s, about 30,000 a year, until the mid-60s when it starts to rise again. Uh, well, why is that? Uh, these divorces are a symptom of a society experiencing new pressures, new freedoms. Second World War um, uh, was, amongst other things, um, a huge experiment in infidelity. Um, the, <laughs> uh, it was quite hard um, 
uh, for people who'd spent five, six years away um, fighting for king and country or, or working on the home front, uh, to readjust to a homestead characterized by conjugal rights, obedience, uh, middle-class couples coming back from this, trying to work out what to do, um, started to see marriage more as a partnership of equals and less as a relationship of fealty. I was reading Dominic Sandbrook, who you might know from The Rest is History, very good podcast. I was reading his interesting book, White Heat, which is a social history of the 1960s. He identifies 1948 as the moment that simultaneous orgasm uh, finds its way into the marriage counselor's vocabulary as a desirable, <laughs> a, a, a desirable um, uh, objective. Um, <laughs> Uh, and the Marriage Guidance Council, uh, which was an organization founded in 1937 by an elderly churchman who was very worried about the uh, pressures of modern life on marriage, uh, jumped in on the simultaneous orgasm bandwagon himself. And he, um, he published a best-selling book um, in the late uh, 40s, um, which uh, sold several million copies by the mid-60s. So the partnership of marriage is developing in all sorts of ways. Um, and that, there may be no coincidence, led to a baby boom. Um, so the UK's population increases by 10% between 45 and 65. It's enormous growth. Um, there's a construction boom which from our perspective, as people who are interested in equity and assets, uh, mean that suddenly most of the country, or more of the country, starts being owner-occupiers. Owner we forget that before the Second World War, almost nobody owned uh, their home. Uh, but that went between 51 and 61 from 29% of the country uh, to 42% of the country. So enormous numbers of people <laughs> buying houses. Um, and so the problem, uh, the law doesn't provide for anything um, to deal with this on separation. Um, you have limited maintenance powers, the common law duty to maintain the wife. Uh, it starts to feel unfair. And the Royal Commission, the 1956 Royal Commission on Divorce, I recommend it to all of you, um, uh, strike a, a, a striking new tone when um, they hear from their witnesses as to what they should do about um, the, the divorce situation. Um, I wonder if I have this one on the slide. Yes. Um, uh, the, the crucial point is that witnesses to this uh, uh, commission start saying, I can't, we can't, the, the, the people we're talking to say, we can't lay a share on the family home, um, uh, save in very limited sort of re resulting trust type circumstances. Um, there's people staying in unhappy marriages because uh, if uh, they leave, they will lose their furniture, they will lose their uh, home. Um, uh, the injustice of it started to feel more palpable. All this brings me on to Denning, who is uh, the hero of this talk in many ways. Um, uh, Lord Denning started his judicial career in 1944 in the divorce courts, um, and he only spent a year there because he didn't like it. He thought it was a squalid business. And I think, um, I think he was uh, right at that time because it was mostly um, proving infidelity and, uh, uh, and matrimonial fault. Um, he, became, uh, he went to the King's Bench, became a Lord Justice of Appeal uh, in 48, became a Law Lord in 57, and then uh, didn't like it in the Law Lords, I think, and went back to the Court of Appeal to be Master of the Rolls in 62. Um, and he, in my view, did more than anyone else uh, prior to the 73 Act, um, and actually since, to advance uh, family law and his conception of the home uh, remains, in my view, a very significant influence on the modern law. So there's two sides to it, and unfortunately time means uh, I can only deal with one side. There's occupation, um, the deserted wife's equity, how do you prevent your husband from kicking you out, um, and there's uh, ownership and equity, and I'm going to focus more on ownership and equity, but both of them turn on the Married Women's Property Act 1882, fascinating statute, um, which for the first time uh, in English legal history ended the coverture, which was where women uh, on marriage surrendered all of their property effectively to their husband, and there was quite limited um, rights that they had against it in future. They became a sort of single economic unit with their husband. Um, the, the Victorians, the late Victorians ended all that, and they provided the divorce court, or the, they provided the county court, I should say, with the power uh, to determine questions of property, summary disputes about uh, property under Section 17 of the NWPA, um, which still sometimes turns up in uh, cases for funny reasons, which um, uh, I've occasionally tried to run. Um, <laughs> not, there, there is a very particular form, and I've actually been unsuccessful because uh, I've put in the wrong form um, on an NWPA case, so that's my other top tip for today. Um, there's very, there's very little evidence. I looked, I spent quite a long time for this talk trying to see if anybody was making clever arguments about sharing and fairness prior to the Second World War, uh, using the power for the court to make an order as it sees fit. Um, prior to the Second World War, they're not. Um, uh, but this is the change with Denning. Um, and as I say, I can't deal with occupation because I haven't got the time, but I just want to start uh, the uh, discussion with um, Lee and Lee, which is, a, which is an occupation case. Um, and this is the first time, this is the first sort of um, flexing of the muscles, I would say, of the um, Section 17 power where uh, some chap was um, trying to sell the family home from under his wife's feet. And uh, he was unsuccessful in that on appeal. Um, Somerville gave the lead judgment, but Denning concurred saying uh, that Section 17 is, is perfectly wide enough to uh, make uh, decisions. Uh, he has jurisdiction, we have jurisdiction under this act to protect the wife in her occupation of the property. Um, even to the extent of preventing the husband from selling it. So the husband effectively had to make alternative 
um, provision for the wife before he could sell uh, the property. And you can see there that Denning's quite careful to say he can't interfere with the title. Um, that's not what Section 17 is for. Uh, but this uh, we can make sort of practical, um, practical decisions about um, what's going on. Um, and he moves very dramatically from this um, over the next few years. And we're just going to try and canter through a few of what I think are quite significant judgments from the 50s and 60s, which um, Denning, Somerville, Roma um, uh, start putting out. So Rim Rim Rimmer um, uh, is a 53 case. Um, and there was a home uh, in the husband's name. And it was mostly paid for by him. And the husband, uh, in the old-fashioned language, turned out the wife and then sold on the property at a profit. Um, and the court at first instance said um, there's rateable shares on a resulting trust basis, so she effectively left with nothing. Um, the Court of Appeal allowed uh, the wife's appeal, um, uh, and Romer LJ, uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, concludes his judgments with this observation. Um, cases between husbands and wives ought not to be governed by the same strict considerations in law and in equity as are commonly applied to the ascertainment of the relative rights of strangers when each of them contributes to the purchase price of the property. And secondly, the old established doctrine that equality, equity leans towards equality is particularly applicable to disputes between husband and wife where the facts as a whole permit of the application. It's quite a radical statement um, in the 50s uh, to, to start suggesting that there might be a different law of property um, for uh, uh, the case between husband and wives as there are with the general public. Cobb and Cobb, next. Um, and this is a Denning uh, case. Again, the court, um, at first instance, I think, found a jointly owned property, so jointly owned the parties, to be theirs jointly, but go on to make an order effectively treating the equity in the property as belonging to the husband, uh, on the basis he contributed to most of it, with a charge in favor of the wife amounting to her contributions. And the wife successfully appealed. And again, I invite you to um, uh, read uh, the words on the screen. There, are, there is a concept of family assets, if Denning may so describe them, such as the matrimonial home and the furniture in it. Uh, and the court leans towards the view that this sort of property like this belongs to them both jointly in equal shares. Um, and that is so even when uh, the conveyance is uh, different. Um, so this concept of the family asset creates the possibility of an asset onto which the court is capable of imposing a result that can conflict with title, can conflict with equity, contributions, or even the party's original intentions. Now, I'm going to suggest that that is starting to sound quite familiar to the modern law of financial remedies, where we regularly um, ignore or gloss over many of those things which would be important to other areas of the law. Um, Freibrandt and Freibrandt is my next one, quite a long quote, I'm afraid. Um, uh, I think uh, this is a, a case where, again, the husband almost entirely financed the property. Um, and at first instance, the wife got a resulting trust base uh, award um, on the traditional uh, rules of resulting trusts. And the High Court overturned that, uh, relying on Cobb, and made a uh, declaration of trust in equal shares. Um, and the Court of Appeal, uh, Denning, uh, dismisses the husband's second appeal. Um, and here he's saying, well, you know, people who get married don't have any intention about what they're going to do with their property because um, they never form the intention. The court has to attribute it to them. This is particularly the case in family assets, by which I mean things intended to be a continuing provision for them during their joint lives, such as the matrimonial home and their furniture in it. So as long as they're living together, it does not matter which of them does the saving and which does the paying, or which of them gives out to work and which looks after the home, so long as the things that they buy are used to their joint benefit. The product belongs to them jointly. Now, Freibrandt at least mentions intention. He says, this is a case where I can't find any intention, so I'm going to do what I feel. Um, but in Hein and Hein, 62, uh, the court departs from intention completely. Um, here, the wife made the main contribution to a property brought shortly before the end of the marriage. Uh, the court below uh, found the intention was to share equally and made the order on that basis. So this is a preponderant contribution from the wife. Uh, and then uh, the court, probably doing its best to follow what Denning had said 10 minutes ago, says actually it should be equality. Uh, she appeals and she gets in front of Denning, who allows her appeal. Um, and Denning gives the lead judgment. This is a family asset. Um, this discretion transcends all rights, legal or equitable, and enables the court to make any such order as it sees fit. This means, as I understand it, this court is entitled to make such an order as appears to be fair and just in all the circumstances of the case. So we've moved in the course of, what's this, 62, 53, when we started with Lee and Lee, where he was saying, you can't interfere with title. This is, this is a very modest power that the court has to deal with um, property. We've now got a quasi-matrimonial causes act jurisdiction, I would say, in the, in the way that we would understand it. And we've got a theory of assets that if they're called family assets, the court will often deal with them equally. It will share in them. And if otherwise, if it considers it's fair to do something else with them, it has the power to impose a concept of fairness. So this is the pre-matrimonial causes act high watermark, I would say, of a discretionary approach to the family home. 
It's a very long way from that caution we saw earlier, um, and it shows, uh, in my view, the crucial conceptual step, which we're still doing today, of identifying the, uh, the asset in question, the family home, as a family asset. Um, and this becomes a license to treat property in an entirely discretionary manner. Um, and then finally, on the Denning cases, uh, Appleton and Appleton, um, and like simply, uh, this is a case, I think, where the husband actually won an appeal for a change. Um, and uh, he had made no direct financial contribution, um, and Denning allowed him a share in the property, saying, I will take the simple test. What is fair and reasonable in the circumstances they've developed, seeing that they are circumstances that nobody has contemplated before? And so the husband got a share in that case. And so by the time we get to the late 1960s, uh, the test being applied under the Married Women's Property Act is vastly different from anything the court has been doing before the Second World War, um, vastly different from what the court was doing in the early 50s. And to me, and you may disagree, but a lot of the language that we hear, hear uh, that it comes out of these judgments sounds very much like the white, post-white jurisprudence. Um, it's couched in slightly different terms. It's on a slightly cozier plane. It's just looking at the home and the furniture, but uh, the language of these judgments felt to me as I read them familiar. Um, why does all this come to an end? Where, where did sharing go for 40 years? Well, in 1969, the House of Lords uh, came uh, to grapple with this issue for the first time. And it's an interesting side note, I think, in matrimonial law, that it's quite rare that the House of Lords actually deals with it. And when they do, it creates a big sea change. Um, you have Pettit and Pettit and Gissing and Gissing. Um, and they put an absolutely firm stop to the development of the law summarized above. And so Pettit, the facts are quite familiar to the ones we've just been looking at in the Denning cases. Uh, the wife inherited the property during the marriage. Um, the husband sought an interest in it. Um, they lived in it as a family home. And the Court of Appeal reluctantly allowed him a share. They felt it was unfair, but they felt they were bound by Appleton to do that, uh, uh, which was on some of the facts, effectively. Anyway, the wife appealed to the House of Lords, and the House of Lords uh, unanimously allowed her appeal, uh, dismissed the husband's interest in the home, and took the chance to consider the development of uh, family assets and claims under Section 17 more generally. Uh, and Lord Reed uh, disapproved of the law in, as it had got to in trenchant terms. He said, the meaning of the statute, the meaning of the section cannot have altered since it was passed in 1882. At that time, certainty and security of rights of property were still generally regarded as paramount importance. And I find it incredible that any parliament of that era could have intended to put the husband's property at the hazard of the unfettered discretion of a judge, including a county court judge, if the wife <laughs> were to raise a dispute about it. Um, and uh, so he, uh, he concluded um, that this was an area of law that needed reform. He could see the justice of uh, what the courts below were doing, but he said that, he, he sounds quite um, Lord sumption in my in my view. He says, this is one that the lay people can do. It's not for us. He says, I think we ought to recognize the difference between cases where we're dealing with lawyers' law and cases where we're dealing with matters that directly affect the lives and interests of large sections of the community and which raise issues which are the subject of public controversy and on which laymen are just as well able to decide as our lawyers. So he says, um, we're going to proceed on the basis of property law. Um, if Parliament wants to do something about it, that's for them. And sure enough, Parliament did. Um, after the judgment, 1970, we get the MPPA, uh, which provides the court uh, with its first powers to deal directly with real property um, via transfer of property orders on a discretionary basis. And that becomes unaltered, the Matrimonial Cause Act 1973, which we all know and love. Who gets the first go at clarifying the statute? Well, it's Lord Denning. Um, in Wachtel and Wachtel, um, Wachtel and Wachtel, uh, which you may know about. Um, uh, it, it, it comes up quite a lot, mostly to have a go at it. I think it's an impressive judgment. Um, he, giving the lead judgment, Lord Denning pronounces uh, the MPPA 1970 as a revolutionary statute that should fundamentally change the approach of the court. Um, he's, uh, he dispatches conduct as the main feature of the statutory principles. So judges, uh, like his honor Judge Hess, have been telling us not to run conduct for uh, coming up to 50 years now. Um, and he went on to consider the effect of the statute on the family so. Now he says, uh, he says, and I think this is disingenuous of him given what we've seen um, uh, uh, previously, he says, the court has never yet succeeded in getting the wife a share in a house uh, by reason of her contributions other than her financial contributions. Now, I find that hard to square um, uh, with, with everything that we've seen him doing over the last 18 years and um, uh, everything that the court of the House of Lords um, uh, thought was wrong about his, his uh, jurisprudence over that time. Um, but he says, uh, and you may know these... Uh, uh, th this uh, phrase that we can take it as read that Parliament has now decided that a person who looks after the home and family contributes to the family assets just as much as the wife who goes out to work. Um, the one contributes in kind, the other in money's worth. Um, if the court comes to the conclusion that the home has been acquired and maintained by the joint efforts of both, then when the marriage breaks down, it should be regarded as a joint property of both, no matter whose name it stands in. 
Um, I would, if I had longer uh, and was a more confident speaker, try and do Denning's marvelous West Country accent, um, uh, but I won't because it doesn't sort of fit with the sort of rap speed that I need to get through uh, this stuff at. It's much more, it's much more masticatory. Um, uh, <laughs> so you can see that this view, um, which he's now saying in Wachtel, which is a very big case from the early 70s, completely unfamiliar, completely unfamiliar ideas uh, to the law of even 18 years before, where um, people are, are saying this is just resulting trust stuff. Um, it's now commonplace, and in 1973, the Law Commission is impaneled to look at a community of property regime, which is, I think, what they're going to perhaps be looking at again or considering again over the next few years. Um, the language of community of property, which is really what sharing is, I think, is a, is a community of property regime um, imposed on people, is grounded firmly in the recognition that the benefit and burden of marriages uh, and children are shared unequally between working husband and housewife, and the law had to provide a remedy to deal with the structural unfairnesses of the nuclear family. Um, and to quote Lord Simon of uh, Glasdale, Glasdale, who was a law lord um, and a keen campaigner for property, uh, community property regimes, and this is him, uh, and I won't read out the whole thing, but this is him in a House of Lords debate on the Inheritance Act. And you can see this is, this is, uh, this is functional domestic economy analysis leading to moral claims. Um, he says, our own law has been woefully defective in vindicating the wife's rights. When I speak of a right, it's not an abstract right. It's a right arising from the very nature of a functional division of labor. And that is, uh, this is a man who's been wholly convinced, I would say, by the uh, those, those um, uh, cases that we looked at through the 50s and 60s. And he is expressing very well uh, the uh, theory, um, the, the, the moral force of what's being said. But anyway, nobody followed Wachtel. After a few years, um, it became laughed at. The one-third rule, which you may, have, um, you may know about, uh, became a very limited assistance in meeting uh, people's needs. Um, it, it wasn't helpful. And Denning himself, um, in the first quote that... Um, I could take from one of my own conferences with a disappointed husband, uh, refused to extend the concept of sharing into business assets. And he says, uh, the wife cannot claim a share in the business as such. Uh, she didn't give any active help in it. Um, she didn't work in it herself. All she did was what a good wife does do. She gave, she gave moral support to the husband by looking after the home. Um, if he was depressed or in difficulty, she would encourage him to keep going. That does not give her a share. So, um, uh, uh, so yes, I've, we've, we've perhaps all heard sentiments like that as we um, tell people that it does, in fact, give her a share. Um, uh, and thereafter, and I'm going to, we're going to skip through a few years, um, between 73 and 2000, as we all know, the case law is dominated by needs and reasonable requirements, um, and which become an art form of their own. Um, and uh, everybody, the only people who were complaining about divorce in the 70s were men who suddenly were faced with very large needs orders. And of course, as we all know, the ordinary run of the case is an enormous needs award um, in favor of the economically weaker party. Um, most of the Lord Chancellor's post bag, he said in that debate, um, or a slightly later one, I think, uh, was not people asking for a community property regime. It was men saying, what have you done to us with the 1973 Act? It's absolutely appalling. So um, uh, by the time uh, the Law Commission got back in 1978, there was no enthusiasm for a community property regime. Time had moved on. So we get 2000, white and white. Um, now, this is Lord Nichols giving the lead judgment, and this is... Uh, uh, he was called to the bar in 1958, and so he, when he's a young man, his time as a law student, the early years of his career, he went into the Chancery um, line of work, coincides with the high watermark of equitable concepts um, as they were applied to divorce. Um, and he is a huge admirer of Lord Denning. He wrote um, a best-selling 2015 memoir um, called Let Equity Prevail, um, and it concludes uh, with a chapter in praise of Lord Denning as one of his greatest influences on his own jurisprudence. He says, as a law student, I love Lord Denning for his determination to find or fashion a way to give effect to the merits of a case. And he says those radical judgments of the 50s and 60s that prioritized fairness over law uh, were marvelous. And he concluded, uh, the judgments of Lord Denning are not really cited much now as they were in the last century. And that is not an adverse reflection on his jurisprudence. That is rather that the system has accepted and absorbed his reforms and has moved on from there. So in white, although none of the Denning cases, I think, were cited in argument, I, it's my contention that Lord Nichols is himself doing a lot of the absorbing of Lord Denning. His judgment is of a piece with those earlier Lord Denning authorities that had been unfollowed, like Wachtel, or disapproved by the House of Lords on an earlier occasion, like Appleton and Hine. The famous passage of White, I could read in a Denning accent because it would equally have found a home in a Denning judgment. And if you read that, I think the, the debt to Denning is clear even in the linguistic style of it. It has that sort of distinctive staccato style that Denning, that, that Denning had. So in my view, White looked radical, largely because Pettit and Gissing had put an end to that sort of discussion. Um, and reasonable requirements had been what everybody had been doing. But 
As far as sharing goes, white is a revival, not a creation, of an equitable language that had been developed nearly half a century before. And the radicalism of white is it doesn't confine the analysis to simply the capital in the home. It's got an altogether less cozy view of uh, domestic capital. But in my view, it's clear that even in the extension, it relies on the analysis of Lord Denning uh, and transmutes those ideas, resting as they do on the assumption of division of labor in marriage. Um, so briefly, when we get to Miller McFarlane, um, this was the quote that first brought the idea of the matrimonial home into mine and Fiona's eyesight, because we, we, I think it's quoted in Sharp and Sharp, and we thought, hmm, um, is the family home always, family, always matrimonial property? Um, and so we, we, Miller and McFarlane, we get, to, we get to sort of paring down what we precisely mean by marital assets, matrimonial assets. Uh, and Lord Nichols says the family home is de facto matrimonial asset, and therefore is always going to be amenable to sharing. Um, now, it's worth remembering that his judgment was, in a fairly technical way, the minority opinion. Um, and Baroness Hale, who, was, who led the majority, didn't really spend much time on the family home. I think she took it as read uh, that it would be a family asset and would generally be divided equally. Uh, and she approved, I think, in part, anyway, Lord Denning's definition of a family asset in Wachtel. And of course, as we've seen uh, from that canter through the 50s cases, Lord Denning's concept of a family asset uh, is not a shorthand for treating assets equally, but for treating assets fairly. And I think that's fundamental to our concept of matrimonial assets as well. And so, um, in the modern law, um, numerous cases say the family home's a matrimonial asset, but it can be divided equally, unequally, if there's good reason to do so. And I'm not going to spend too much time on those, but see, for example, uh, Mr. Justice Mostyn in SNAG, um, who, who says it very succinctly. Um, and in my view, um, that is inherent to the nature of a matrimonial asset, which is a legal device for imposing fairness. Uh, it's not always the same thing as equality. And that, as I hope I've shown, I think all of that comes out of interesting arguments that people were having in the 50s and 60s about the family home. Um, so I want to conclude this lecture, and I say conclude, I've still got, I think, a few pages to go, um, by focusing on uh, where this all might go next. Um, Baroness Teacher's draft bill, it seems sharing is so settled, um, it can be written onto a statutory footing. I don't know if you've read it, but her bill provides for a fair sharing of the matrimonial property of parties to the marriage. So a home uses a marital home should always be treated as matrimonial property, even if it's acquired prior to the marriage. So she takes the the Lord Nichols uh, summary as the basis of her drafting there. And she says, uh, fairness is equivalent to equality um, in statute, so it should be divided equally, but with some very limited exceptions relating to the needs of minor children, nuptial agreements, um, and so forth. So her motivation is primarily to reduce the unpredictability of cases and the cost of them. But interestingly, she also uh, plants her flag on an argument that society has profoundly changed since the 70s. Um, and uh, this is... And hey, I hadn't realized. Um, and so this was uh, her introduction uh, from um, uh, the uh, bill, uh, introducing the bill to the House of Lords on 11th May 2018. Uh, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. She could probably read it better than me. You see um, and uh, what I thought was really interesting about this is it points out that society has changed a great deal. We have, we have um, uh, working, many more working mothers, whereas in 95 we only had half. Um, and this got me wondering, I mean, this is really a, this is really a, um, uh, a, a, a piece of argument about the maintenance orders, which were another part of uh, the draft bill. Um, uh, but it got me wondering, is her charge that a more egalitarian society, as we now in some ways have, um, renders these principles grounded in structural analysis of a less egalitarian society, such as we had in the 70s, um, patronizing? Is that a fair charge? Um, uh, well, firstly, the national income skew between men and women, uh, I was looking at this morning, tells its own tale of ongoing sex inequality. So apparently, um, as of 2020, 14.52 trillion pounds of national income was earned by men against 9.25 trillion pounds uh, by women. Um, although the female income share is growing proportionately faster than the men's eyes. Um, so women do seem to take a disproportionate hit from or, or exclusion from the labor force, and whether that comes from care roles, children, labor force interruption, who is to say, per combination. But it is also true uh, that society has changed very significantly since the 70s, and even since 2000. And quite recently, um, on the 23rd of September, the British Social Attitudes Survey um, gave its latest update, update number 40. And you can see that even um, in a relatively short space of time, in a couple of decades, lots and lots of uh, questions that inform how we work, um, people have changed their minds about. Um, so in 1987, I'm only going to read a couple of them out, but for example, in 1987, um, 48% uh, of people thought um, a man's job was to earn money and a woman's job was to look after the home. That's gone down to 9% today. In 2012, 
Uh, 31% of people felt the best arrangement uh, for preschool children was for the mother to stay at home and the father to work full time, and that's fallen significantly, only 18%. Um, and beyond attitudes, this, there we go. Um, and beyond those attitudes, there are underlying social changes at play. Um, so as of 2021, both, more than 50% of parents in this country now both work full time. It's a significant change, uh, up from 42% in 2013. So more and more people are re-entering the workforce. Participation by mothers in the labor force is now at 75%. That's an increase of 10% in the last 20 years. Um, people are having children later. They're getting married later. The average age of buying your first home is later. It's now 34, apparently. And the average age in 20, even in 2007 was only 28. So it's gone up by six years in a short space of time. Uh, the inflation-adjusted deposit for your first home has also got much higher. Owner occupation has fallen from a high of 70% in 2000 to 64% in 2022. So the number of people renting is going up proportionately to the owners. The number of cohabitants uh, has increased um, to now about 22% of couples who live together are now cohabitants. So they're the fastest growing family type. Um, and interestingly, I didn't know, uh, this struck me as quite high, but the Marriage Foundation, um, which uh, uh, does research into marriage, um, believes that about a fifth of couples who've married since 2000 have a prenup. And that's an average figure that rises to about, they think, 44% of those who are in the top ABC brackets of income. Um, that feels high to me, but um, and they say in their own reporting they were taken aback by that, but that's what their, their survey suggested. And then finally, and it's worth noting that the number of foreign-born usual residents in the UK increased from 8.9% of the total population in 2001 to 16.8% in 2021. So dramatic uh, changes to the uh, fundamentals of our society. To summarize, people are marrying later, they're buying later, they're saving for property for longer, they're applying more savings to their property. We might speculate their premarital property is likely to be larger and more significant to them than it was hitherto. An ever more significant minority are born abroad, perhaps into cultures which possibly have very different values to those expressed in the dennings nichols analysis of the family. When families have children, they're both more likely to return to the workforce than they ever were before. Um, if they divorce, it's likely to be after a marriage which of a median period of 12 years, so we might say a non-definitional percentage of their average life, their adult life. Statistics, unfortunately, that measure the balance of who does the childcare after separation are very hard to come by. But we might speculate that with changing conceptions of domestic fatherhood and working motherhood since the 70s, care after separation is overall more evenly split between the two sexes than ever before. So we are, I would suggest, moving slowly further away from the world of breadwinners and homemakers. Um, in marriage, and their friends, when they go out for dinner, are more likely than ever before to be cohabitants and not married couples, and they will in many cases, albeit not the ones we see at the bar, have some sort of express contributions-based arrangement, or at least some active mind will be applied to how they hold their property. And interestingly, a significant minority of those who do marry have decided the ordinary consequences of English law are not for them. And for those of us who have experience of prenups, they're normally attempts to contract out of sharing. So in these circumstances, is it too much to speculate that we may have now seen the high watermark of sharing? Will actual contributions that people have made to an asset take on a greater significance once again? Does a more egalitarian, more heterodox society have less need of, or perhaps just less desire for, the protection against gender-based inequities uh, than the world in the 1950s and 1960s did? Of course, Lord Nichols and even Lord Denning were careful to note that their analysis was not confined to the traditional division of labor albeit I would suggest this is firmly what they both had in mind. However, the law now explicitly recognizes that sharing is but one way to perceive fairness in a relationship, see the supervening value of autonomy as expressed in prenups. So does this mean that those who don't have prenups are imputed with a full understanding of what they're letting themselves in for otherwise? Sharing community property is a drastic remedy to impose on people if we decide, as we have done, that it is effectively an opt-in by default regime, and reasonable people can and do otherwise differ. Other countries which impose a community property regime make you sign a piece of paper when you get married. Any suggestion, however, that these principles are confined to particular types of marriage, aside from those with prenups, has been trenchantly rejected by, for example, Mr. Justice Mostyn in e &L. So, it seems to me that new challenges to the assumptions of the sharing principle may be a reasonable bet to make against the changing canvas of British society. Consider Australia, so often the pioneer in social change. They have uh, a property settlement law on divorce, and their jurisprudence eschews equal division and sharing as too simplistic. And it instead mandates an exercise where the court takes as its starting point the discovery and declaration of the proprietary interests of parties to the actual assets by reference to the normal rules of law. And then it weighs all of the contributions, direct and indirect, financial and non-financial, 
to determine the outcome. So they place a much greater premium on what people have actually got before we look at dividing it. And finally, it will be interesting to see if, as Labour have now announced, cohabitant financial rights are placed on a statutory footing, whether greater significance is paid to contributions and the autonomy of the parties to such families, who, after all, will never have agreed to submit to a property regime and may even have remained unmarried to stay outside of one. If financial remedies law teaches us everything, teaches us anything, it's that, <laughs> it's that fairness is in the eye of an ever-changing cast of beholders, and we are never at the end of history. Thank you very much.